from you buyers? What's the word on the street? What, what objections are popping up that you want to make sure that we address? Mortgage contingency dates. Mortgage contingency dates. So what's the objection? Well, the objection is that, um, they believe that the offer is better because there is no mortgage contingency than if there is, or that the cash offer is better than having a mortgage. Well, so is, is, that a, is that a buyer objection or is that really a seller conversation? A little of both. Some buyers are, um, are saying that they don't, you know, they would like to go in without the mortgage contingency. And um, then I guess maybe that would be a seller's objection too. <laughs> so, so, so you're a week well, early. That's both. Right, and so, and so not, not invalid, um, not an invalid topic. Um, and, and we can kind of circle through how, how that looks and how, and how maybe buyers are, um, are utilizing contingency dates uh, right now as, as part of their offers. <clears throat> but I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look for some additional specific buyer objections uh, and then kind of work through all of them and, and incorporate the, the conversation to include that, um, that mortgage conversation, if that's all right. Sure. Lisa. I, I, they found a house they love. Uh, I don't want to get into a bidding war. Um, you know, I don't know, should we, we don't want to have to bid full price. Um, and the bidding war thing is big. It's really big. They don't want to, don't want to get anywhere near it. They'd rather lose the house. All right. So let's, let's start there if we could. Um, because it's a pretty popular objection, right? With, with buyers, the I don't want to get into a bidding war objection. How, how are, uh, have some of you had that objection pop up and how are you handling it <clears throat> so that we can, uh, we can kind of walk our way through some of, the, um, some of the scripts that you're currently using and hone them to, uh, to find one that everyone loves. Uh, Rick, I wanted to add with uh, Lisa one thing. Um, uh, I always see like uh, they say I don't. Uh, I I I rather uh, you know lose the house, but I don't want to go into the bidding. Uh, you know the thing, but if they lose the house, so they get upset. So how we can uh, you know uh, navigate them in that uh, situation? Got it. So 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 what I'm hearing is. You know, the, the, the objection is, I don't want a bidding war, I'd rather lose the house. And then they go ahead and lose the house and then they're upset they lost the house. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of, we call that in, in, the, in the world of working with buyers, we call that Tuesday, right? And Thursday and Saturday, right? Because that's just kind of how, how it works. And so, so let's, let's incorporate um, that into this, this discussion. Anybody, anybody using something right now that they find relatively effective for uh, for that objection. And so while you're thinking about that, I'm going to, I'm going to do what, what sometimes people get annoyed with me for doing. Um, so, so apologies if this is annoying and, and yet it's, it's um, functionally, it's the path we have to go down, right? Because every objection handling session that we have for those of you who have plugged into one of these before, I'm going to always redirect us to have a conversation before we just start throwing out scripts to handle an objection, to throw us back to a conversation that says, what kind of expectation setting conversations are you having? And what kind of buyer consult are you having? Because if, if you're having no buyer consult and not setting expectations up front, then the, the objection handler to, to something like, I don't want to be in a bidding war, I don't care if I lose the house, are way different and frankly, way harder. Right, because, because the idea, uh, how many of you were on the, the nine o'clock call yesterday morning when Chris Kling was the, uh, was the guest, right? 
he was a great guest, I thought, because he, he gave us a clue as to uh, as how to handle uh, objections with buyers right now. And what he said that he's doing with all of his current buyers is he's calling them back in, either in person or Zoom, however he's working that out, for what? What did he say? To do another presentation, to, to refresh them. To reconsult them, right? To do a second buyer consult. Because he, in his words, enough time has gone on, right? Maybe they've lost a couple of houses. Maybe, maybe they started and, and things changed. Maybe, maybe their, their price point has changed. Enough has happened in the last couple of weeks to, to couple of months that he's pulling them all back in, regardless of how long he's working with them, to have a second consult. To say, look, I just wanted to, to get together one more time to make sure we're all on the same page about what this market actually looks like and what you can expect once, you, once you're out in the fray. And the, the idea of setting proper expectations with buyers, what expectation might you set to help you objection handle the, I don't wanna get into a bidding war objection? What might you say up front that would help that conversation? What if, what if you just told them the facts right up front? How many of you are currently working with buyers where an offer was made and it wasn't a multiple offer, right? I mean, the, the reality of our market right now for buyers is that if they're not willing to dive into multiple offers, now may not be the time for them to be on the, in the market. And unfortunately, because we ourselves are so anxious to sell them a house, we don't say those things up front for fear that they, you might lose a client. Well, if, you, if they're not buying anyway, because they, three weeks later, they find the house they, they love and they're not willing to be in a bidding war and you didn't tell them three weeks ago that almost every offer you write is likely going to be at or above asking price and you may have to fight off others to win, if you didn't disclose that to them, well, it's no wonder they're upset when they lose the house. And if you wait to have that conversation once they're interested in a house, it almost always comes off the same way. I have been doing this for 21 years, and for 21 years, my experience says that when you wait to have the conversation after they fall in love with a house, that the market's really hot, they have to go in strong, they have to write an offer at or over asking price and that there's probably going to be multiples. It only ever comes off like you being concerned about selling a house, not protecting them and their money. It's just the way it works, right? So I think that the, the idea of, of me giving you words to fight off the, the I don't wanna go into a bidding war has to start way before they have found a house. It has to start the first time you talk to these folks. Your consultation has to have the words in it that, that start with, you know, it is so great to meet you. I'm so excited to get started. Let's go through what you're looking for. By the way, I'm curious. Do you have any understanding of the marketplace in Connecticut right now, especially Fairfield County? Ask them the question. Have them tell you. Right? If anyone's been paying attention to anything that's going on, what they're going to say is, well, people are coming out of the city. I imagine things are moving pretty quickly here. You got it. Can I give you some examples of what quickly actually means? And then have three different examples, maybe four, of properties that meet their criteria that had you met with them last week, they could have seen that because you're reading with them this week, went under agreement in the last seven days. Show them the things that they can't see. Had we met a week earlier, these were actually available to you, but things are moving so quickly, they're no longer available. And then show them, at, so at least two of those, and then maybe two other properties where you can show them quite clearly, here's a property in your price range, it came on about 60 days ago, it was on the market for 48 hours, 
as you can see here, it closed $30,000 over the 450 asking price. Now, I wasn't personally involved in this particular transaction. However, I can tell you that being involved in many, many others, there were at least two or three offers on this particular property. Show them, not, don't just tell them, show them the actual reality of the market they're getting ready to go into. Marilyn, you said it, you had a question on, uh, on, on, on a point. I'm sorry, I'm just seeing that in the chat. Tell me the question. Uh, so I have a situation or I had a situation where, you know, the client is clear that we're going into highest and best situations. Uh, we're primarily in Westchester and we went after a house. It was priced at 595, which I clearly knew it was, it was below market and she offered 600 and I knew it wasn't going to get it, but fine. I waited for the highest and best and she wanted to do 610. And I said, well, I'm certain 610 is not gonna get it. Where are you most comfortable paying for this house from the numbers, the comps that I ran? This house is a, a solid 650. So I'm, I'm certain 610 and she was really reluctant just because sometimes they just feel that the asking price is firm and set and don't understand that it's just not that way. Um, so what would be, uh, how would I manage that argument where I'm going 10,000 or 20,000 above, like that has to be good enough when clearly most of the time it may not be. Right. So, so great question. And so, so let's, let's explore that a little bit further, right? For me, it's always about data, right? If, if, if all you're doing is telling them it's not going to work, if you're telling them it's not enough money, well, th that, that, that real estate agent slime starts to kind of ooze over the whole conversation, right? And I don't say that to be disrespectful to any of us. I, I like you, I'm a, I'm a real estate agent. And yet, do you agree that our industry sometimes gets a bad rap for, you know, the hell with you, I just want to sell a house. Right. Yes. And so, so, so the idea would be, again, starting ahead of time with the, with the, with the expectation setting to show them, right? If, so if you already know that 610 isn't going to work, there's a reason that you know that. Presumably the reason is because you're watching the market and you know that those properties in that neighborhood or in that town or in that price point are selling five, eight, ten percent higher than the than the asking price. And you should be able to pull actual examples of properties. So he, here's the thing, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, understanding that you're looking at uh, at 610, the last three 595s that sold sold at 8%, 9%, and 12% over the asking price. I'm curious, what do you think that means for this 595 house? You know, give them the data to help make the decision. The other thing I would, I would encourage you to do is to, to have them recognize so, so again, that's all expectation, it's, it's expectation setting. And then with a specific house, it may be bringing comps to the, to the conversation to write the offer, right? So it, it's a combination then of what you, what you set up with them. And now in the moment, we, we need to be looking and seeing what the last three properties were that closed to see where that, where that opportunity actually is. But remember, if you set the proper expectation during the, during the, the consult for someone who's looking at around $600,000 and you know because the data tells you that price, prices in the high fives or low sixes are selling between five and 10% over the asking price on average, and you plant that seed at the consult, then when they find a house they love and it's 595 and they wanna to go to six, only 610, you can remind them of the conversation. So I'm curious, Mrs. Beyer, do you remember the conversation we had about homes selling in this price range? Well, yes. What was that conversation? Do you remember what we said about the, the multiple over asking price that, that homes were typically selling for? 
Well, I think we said between five and 10%. Yes, and so just, just to do the math out, what's five to 10% higher than 595? Well, it's between you know 640 and 675 or whatever the numbers are. Yeah, I agree. And so I'm curious, knowing that, that most people are paying between 640 and 675 for a house listed at 595, as evidenced by these last three sold comps, that an appraiser would likely use to justify your loan. I'm curious, is there a reason the seller would, would look at your offer over others and have you be successful being the winning bid at a number that isn't between that 640 and 675 range? Do you see how you're just driving them back to the numbers? You're driving them back to the facts? It's not about your opinion? Now, some buyers may say, well, I don't care because all I'm willing to pay is 610. I'm not overpaying for this house. And that's okay. Great. You know what? I understand. I'm just, I just want to, I want to, wanted to be certain that you were clear about what the market is saying likely has to be done for you to come out on top. If you're okay rolling the dice and not coming out on top, let's move forward and present this as strongly as we possibly can. I just want you to make a decision based on the facts. Right, and so that sort of solves that issue later on when they come back and they don't get the house and now they're upset. I understand, I understand that that is upsetting. I'm curious, what decisions different than the decisions you made this time might you make on the next house to make sure you do come out on top? For those of you who have struggled with people who have lost houses and are upset about it, that's a really good question I just put on the table. As long as you've set the expectations with them and given them data, right? Because here's the reality. They don't get to blame you for that. They made the decision. You put all the, all the pieces on the table and encouraged them to make a decision. And now they made a decision. And the results of that decision are X. So don't be afraid to then hold the situation accountable for the result. Be understanding because it does suck, right, that they didn't get the house. Not because you didn't get a commission, but because they wanted that house. Here's the other thing to remember. I'm fascinated, so before I give you that, I'm fascinated, I want what Lisa Lee has. Because Lisa Lee, like at the, at the Oscars, you know when someone in the first couple of rows gets up from their seat and they have the people who run down the aisles to make sure there's no empty seats? That's what Lisa Lee has in her house. She has someone to keep her seat nice and toasty warm for her while she goes off to do whatever she's doing, only to come back and have a nice warm seat. I want that. Send David over here, will you? Very expensive, Rick. It's very expensive. <laughs> so, um, so here's the other thing to remember. This, this might help you. I like this script a lot. So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, this is, again, this is in the consult and maybe a couple of times during your, during your, um, your shopping experience with them. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, one of the things I want you to remember, especially in a market that is moving as quickly as this one is, is that the asking price that a seller sets is the minimum expectation that that seller has for that home. The asking price is the minimum expectation that that seller has for that home. Guys, we, we've spent too many years believing, and, and, and part, the market has, has, has pushed this forward on us, believing that the asking price is some simple suggestion that somebody came up with, and our job on the buyer's side is to make an offer off of that and we end up someplace in between. I will tell you personally that that is not how I, I personally negotiate. When I buy houses for myself, I run the numbers, I look at the scenario, and I tell the seller what I'm willing to pay for the house. I don't do the whole up and down, back and forth, in and out. I'm willing to pay you $610,000 for this house based on the data, based on the all those things. Are you willing to accept it? 
And if they come back and say, well, no, we, we really want 625, okay, I get it. And yet I'm willing to pay 610. So if you're not willing to accept 610, we can just move on, right? Now, again, some of you would love to have buyers as objective as I'm sounding right now. And that's not the way buyers typically work, right? They're far more subjective and far more emotional in how they respond to things. But part of that is our doing, right? If we can, if we can help set a, 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 an expectation up front of moving forward objectively, it's either yes or it's no. I'm curious, knowing the circumstances around this house, that there are multiple offers, that the asking price is a simple suggestion, excuse me, a simple, uh, uh, what did I say to you before? The asking price is a, a minimum expectation of, somebody read it because I, I, I clearly can't remember my name. You said that the asking price in a market such as this is the minimum expectation that this seller has for this home. There we go. So minimum expectation was right. So minimum expectation that the seller has for, um, for this particular property, right? Knowing all of that, are you still interested in moving forward? And then it's just a decision, yes or no. Are you armed with scripts to help them through the multiple offer scenario, right? Some of you have heard the, the, the conversation that, uh, that I've put on the table before in multiple offer scenarios, that conversation being, so Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, <clears throat> in scenarios like this, experience tells me that there are probably multiple, when, when we're told multiple offers, what that probably means in a situation like this is that there's likely three or more offers on the table. I'm not even sure in this market that I would use the example that I typically give of two or more versus, uh, excuse me, two offers versus three or more. I would just dive right to the three or more because that's more than likely where they're at. So what's likely is that there are three or more offers and experience tells me that in a scenario where there are three or more offers, that typically someone is at the asking price, someone is below the asking price, and the rest are all above the asking price. I'm curious, which of those do you want to be? Right, paint it out for them. In multiple offers, someone's at the asking price, someone's below it, and then the rest are above it. First question, which do you want to be? In order to be the winner of that house, which of those three, do you, four, uh, which of those three categories do you want to be in? Well, I want to be the winner, so I guess I want to be above the asking price. Got it. I think that's a great decision. So I'm curious, as one of the, uh, one of the offers that's going to end up being above the asking price, and knowing that the asking price is the minimum expectation, set by the seller, I want you to look at the rest of the money that you're willing to spend as insurance that you're purchasing to make sure that you come out on top. So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, in this scenario, how much insurance are you willing to purchase on top of that 595 number to make sure that you come out on top? Guys, if you've never used that script, I encourage you to use it. I, I used it successfully for most of my career with buyers. And I, I, was, I worked in, a, in a, a market that was 2000 to 2005, 2006, where things weren't quite as fast paced as they are today, but four, five, and into early 06, they were pretty darn close. And one of my specialties was winning multiple offers. And a lot of it was just with that script to help people see the objectivity of paying more, right? That was what I was attempting to accomplish, is to not make paying more for a house a subjective thing. You're paying more for a house because you choose to use your money to live there. There's no, there, that's not fear-based, right? Let me just put this out there just in case. Please don't make the mistake 
of peddling down the path of saying things like, oh, I, 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 can't, I can't let you overpay for this house. Not because I don't want you to protect your buyers. That's not said from a, from a salesman-y perspective. It's said because you don't have a role in deciding how the buyer spends their money. You don't get an opinion on that. And so for you, for, personally, for you to say something like, I can't let you overspend on this house, I can't let you go that high, I think is massively presumptuous. And trust me, as someone who has had that said to me, I didn't like it. I pushed back on that. Say, well, thank you for your opinion. Last I checked, this is my money. I get to spend my money the way I want to spend my money. Now that's different than you laying out the facts to say, okay, so if you're looking to spend $50,000 on insurance to come out on top, that would be a 645 purchase. Let's take a look and make sure that the market would support that. Let's take a look and see what comps might be available to see, to see, make sure that the appraisal will move forward. Let's take a look at, you know, if, if, if the market doesn't continue doing what it's doing and you have to sell this house in three years or less, you may not see that come back to you. Are you okay with that, right? That doesn't mean don't consult them through the options and the possibilities of them spending 645. Just do it from a data-driven objective perspective. Trust me when I tell you, you will be far more appreciated by the buyer to pay them the respect of giving them data to help them make a great decision about what they want to do rather than you rushing in and, and making it for them. Because most buyers don't want you to do that. Even if they ask you to do it, they don't really want you to do it, right? Because it's their money. Rick? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I heard this from a client that they thought that they could not get a loan if the appraised value didn't come in as high you can still go forward with those purchases and you stand, can still get a loan. You just end up paying the difference, which for many clients is acceptable. Yeah, so Karen makes an enormously um, important and valid point, right? And that is be careful that you're not solving a problem that doesn't yet exist, right? Be careful you're not solving a problem that doesn't yet exist. Oh my goodness, I think Rudy has de-aged himself. He's gone back in time. We're going to have to start calling him Benjamin Button. Hello, Rudy's son. Give us a wave. No, he ran away. <laughs> Dad, they're talking to me. So, so be really cautious right around that. And here's what I mean. When someone says I'm looking to put $50,000 on top of this 595 as insurance to make sure I come out on top because I'm recognizing based on the facts and data that you've given to me that price points in this range are typically closing between five and 10% higher than the, than the list price and the list price is a mere suggestion, a simple expectation of what the seller is looking for. Don't say well, you know what, it might not appraise, and then we're screwed. Because here's what I can tell you. When you use that as a, as a tool to attempt to get the listing agent to recognize that your offer is okay enough that they should say yes to it, not the higher ones, the listing agent's looking at you the same way that Karen just did, to say that that's not a valid argument. <laughs> the fact that it doesn't appraise doesn't kill the deal most of the time, right? It sends people back into making some different decisions. Sometimes the buyer has to put more down. Because the, the, the fact that's that it didn't appraise only means the bank is willing to lend off of a lower number. So it's just the same if they were getting 75% loan off of, off of 640 and it only appraises for 630, you only have to bring an additional 25% to the table off of $10,000. That's 2,500 bucks, right? For many, many buyers, that's not a concern. Sorry, Karen, go ahead. No, it's just the, um, I forgot what I was gonna say um, about the 
appraisal, oh, I know what I was gonna say. Um, the, with the appraisals, sometimes it doesn't appraise today because closings haven't had a chance to catch up. So it may be what the market is um, driving towards, but it just may, we may not have the closed sales to support that value today. That doesn't mean it's not going to be worth that next month or the month after. Yeah, or just next week. That appraisal today. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so, so my point anything. is, be really careful that you're not solving problems that don't exist yet. And my point there is, the, 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 your buyers have to win the house first. If they don't win the house, whether or not the, the house will appraise is not their problem, right? So step them through the process. Let's win the house. And then if it doesn't appraise, we'll deal with that then, right? Karen's excellent at moving at going back and, and trying to either either fight appraisals or or working things out to figure out how we can continue to move forward. Right. Sometimes the seller concedes a little bit. The buyers bring a little more to the table. Right. Sometimes Karen's successful in going back to the appraiser to say, well, hey, you didn't use this one. If you use this one, might it change the numbers just a smidge to get this to appraise? And the, and the appraiser sometimes says yes and, 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 and we'll redo the appraisal. Right. So there, there are ways to troubleshoot that when it comes up. Don't confuse everybody during the offer process because that problem hasn't come up yet, right? And just because you think it might come up doesn't mean it will come up, right? I'm in the middle of a refinance right now. I kind of thought that maybe I'd struggle with, a, with, a, um, with an appraisal. I didn't struggle with an appraisal at all. It was $50,000, the appraisal came in $50,000 than the number that I thought was a stretch for my house. So all that worrying I did, and truth be told, Karen kept saying, stop worrying, it'll be fine. Stop worrying, it'll be fine. Stop worrying, it'll be fine. Right, all that worrying I did, it, it, I never had to deal with the issue. But do you see my point? If you're worried about it, well, whether, whether or not you're directly or indirectly helping the client to worry about it, now there's just more emotion and more drama going on inside of the transaction, which by the way, also clouds judgment based on objective facts about how to move forward to win the house. So now all of a sudden, you and the clients are all in a, in a whole hair on fire moment around something that, that isn't a problem yet. And they end up making a bad decision because they don't want to get into a problem with an appraisal that hasn't even come, the problem hasn't come up yet. So they make a worse decision about the number they're going to put on the, on the offer to win the house. Do you see how problematic that is? Do you see why we're having a, a, such a lengthy conversation around strategy in the consult and expectation setting versus simple scripts to help a buyer magically feel differently? Because I don't know about those, uh, the rest of you, but those of you who have, who have sold houses for a number of years, I think we would agree with me when I say, most of the time, the issues that pop up, if you've set great expectations, you can go back and lean on those and the words are simple and the ideas are simple to help solve the problems. If you haven't done that, there almost are no magic words to help solve a problem if you haven't set the right expectations. You end up digging and digging and digging far deeper and far longer. All right, what else? Rick, I have a, I have a question for you. Oui. We had, a, we had a, a very unusual situation. We did set the client's expectations that, you know, it was a hot market. They knew it. We took them out to see three properties. They kind of liked one of them. And the day after we showed them the property, the property went, it had been on the market less than a week. It went from $699 down to $625. They wanted to go see the property again. Then 17 hours later, the, the agent, the listing agent put the property back up to 650. So we went to look at the property a second time. 
They were very motivated. They were, you know, contemplating putting in an offer. We were calling the listing agent. Listing agent wasn't uh, coming back to us and giving us any information. And when we did finally get a communication from the listing agent, they just texted to us, um, accepted offer. How would we best manage that emotion that those buyers, those clients were going through during that process? It was very, to us, it was very screwy deal. Mm -hmm. We didn't understand the whole yo-yo in 17 hours. Sure. Uh, so, so, so here, a couple of things. The first thing I would say is, um, I, I literally had this conversation yesterday with someone. Um, what markets like this do are bring all the things you never saw before or never thought you'd see right to the, right to the forefront. It's like, really? Oh, okay. Never saw that before. Never had to handle that before. Never thought that was possible. And, and so from the perspective of how we look at those things, again, you're going you're gonna to hear a theme from me is stay, stay crazy objective, right? When I hear you say the hat price was here, the price was down here, then it was up here. I look at that and say, yep. And if the, if the question is, well, why are they doing that? Don't know. Don't, don't know. Can certainly call and ask, but here's what I can tell you. It's probably not as relevant as you making a decision to make a, a, an offer on this property right now. And so where, where I hear, uh, David, you describe the, the scenario, I think that first time when they said, this is kind of, this is a house that I think I might want to take a second look at, great, let's write the offer, get the offer in, and then we can go back and look at it a second time. You've got to, strategically, you've got to help people recognize that even though we've set the expectation of a really fast, hot market, we have to be willing to follow it up by saying, look, it is not in your best interest to wait. It is not in your best interest to make the, uh, the offer secondary to talking to, a, to a, 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 um, um, a pool person or talking to, a, to another vendor or going and seeing a second time or getting your parents' opinion or all those things. You can make the offer and write in a contingency, right? So you make that offer right away, contingent upon buyers taking a second walk through the house and whatever else, right? But you've, you've got to help them recognize that part of the expectation setting, part of all that conversation we had with you was to set you up for the win. And I have to think about it overnight is not part of that strategy. And I'm sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, if that sounds aggressive, I am simply being aggressive on your behalf. Because experience tells me that things are moving fast enough that by tomorrow afternoon, the property may not be available any longer. Right? The, right. The does, that, does that help, David? Yeah, no, that, that helps a lot. It's just... It was just so strange. I've never, I mean, not that we've been in this that long, but in my experience of buying and selling houses, it was really very strange pricing and so on and so forth. So, I mean, luckily the clients are okay now and they were going off. And in fact, they've decided to move their price point up a little. Um, but anyways, it was just very strange. Yeah. So let's, let's address two other things. Um, first, making offers sight unseen. Um, I, I know that sounds, sounds like terrifying to some of you from a customer service perspective. And yet, I, I, I know that there are some of you on this call who have successfully written offers in the last three to four months with people who, some of you have written offers with people you've never met, submitted them, had them go, and you, you kind of met them at the inspection. And some of you have written offers where the, uh, the buyers have never actually stepped foot in the house. It's part of how you win in a market that's moving this quickly, right? Is it every single time? No. However, again, if, if I were setting expectations up front in my consult, I would put that on the table. So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, here are some strategies 
that my colleagues and I have been utilizing with buyers to help them come out on top. Well, on top of what? Well, multiple offer scenarios, of course. Well, I don't want to be involved in a, in a multiple offer bid. I understand. And unfortunately, if that is truly your desire, this may not be the time for you to be a buyer. I'm curious, can you tell me what, what is it about being in a multiple offer scenario that, is, that concerns you? Have them give you the, the list. Because mostly the answer to that is, well, I don't, I don't want to have to, you know, quote unquote, overpay or pay more for a property than I have to. Got it. Would it surprise you to know that in the last 60 days in this price point in this town or city, that the, the average list to sale ratio is 102% of asking? So do you see how you entering this fray and expecting not to have to pay over the asking price is probably, probably not an expectation that the market can meet right now. And so it's okay if you choose to step out of the market. Let's talk about all the positives though. Let's talk about, let's talk about interest rates. Are you aware of where interest rates are? Well, yes, they're, they're like lower than they've ever been ever on planet Earth. Correct. And so I'm curious, is that a benefit to you? Well, yes. I'm curious, is it, a, is it a benefit to you in terms of balancing out the monthly payment? If you have to overspend to obtain a house that you really want to live in, knowing that the interest rate is so low, does that kind of counterbalance the monthly payment for you to make that house the same affordability as if you were paying a little less with a slightly higher interest rate. Oh, hmm. well, I'd never thought of that. So does that give you some additional confidence? Guys, it should. Are you, are you utilizing interest rates as a script to help them understand that there's far more buying power. You can afford to spend an extra 10 or $20,000 because the interest rates aren't 4%, they're 2.75%, right? And that probably equates to 10 or 15 or so thousand dollars in additional buying power. I'm certain we don't have to put on the table today that when, when you have buyers who say, well, I'm looking for a bargain, I think, I think the script is pretty easy on that one. It starts like this. <laughs> oh man, that's a good one. You're killing me. No, for real. Right? And again, many of you have heard me say this before. Back in, back in, uh, in 04, 05, 06, people would come and sit with us and say, you know, what, what, you know as we were going through the consult, tell me what it is you're, you're, uh, you're looking for. And the first thing they would say is, well, we want to buy a, a bargain. Understood. Can you define bargain for me? Well, what do you mean? Well, I'm assuming you, you're talking about a price point. And so are you talking about purchasing something for 2% for under value or 5% or 10%? Oh, okay. Well, uh, we hadn't really considered that. Okay, well, let's consider it. Let's figure out what, what it is you're looking for. How much under value are you looking to define bargain as? And I would walk them, I would help them figure out, well, you know, we're looking in the 550 to 600 range. So we would like to ultimately buy something that's, you know, for five or 515, maybe 525, that's valued at 575 or 600. Understood. Would it surprise you to know that we don't have that here? That was my script. That, that, I, I agree. And trust me, if I could find that, I think I'd beat you to it and I'd buy it for an investment property. Right, so don't be afraid to set expectations with facts, but then also don't be afraid to just simply tell the truth. I mean, if someone's looking to find a property valued in the high fives that they can buy for five or 515 today, what do you think the chances of success are? 
do you agree that the chances of success in finding that are almost zero? And do you see that if you're not just honest with them about that, well now, because you want a client, you go out and you keep showing them these properties and they keep making offers on these properties that are lower than they need to be so they're not winning. Do you see how frustrating that is for everybody? It's no wonder at some point you're frustrated with them, they're irritated, they blame you, they think you don't know what you're doing because you can't get them a house. Right? But you've set that up with, with, by not telling the truth, by not being clear, by not being objective. I have to tell you, I, I still scratch my head when people say to me, I've written you know, 15 offers for the, same, for the same buyer and we just can't get one accepted. Guys, that, that is, I am sorry to say, that is not the market and it's not the buyer. It's you. I'm sorry. I love you. And it's you, right? You have to come, you have to approach that differently. You have to do a reset. You have to do like Chris Kling told us yesterday. You've got to bring them back to the table and have a, a new consultation. Because man, oh man, like shoot me now. And I'm saying that as the real estate agent, I'm saying that as the buyer. That, it's not that hard, regardless of what the market's doing. It's not that hard, right? And so another strategy from a scripting perspective could be, maybe I pull Robbie back in and, and he and I have this conversation that says, you know, Robbie, you've been looking up to about six knowing full well that based on the market data, <clears throat> you're going to have to pay a five to 10% premium to be the winner on those properties, yes? So I'm curious, does it make sense for us, instead of being tortured at the top, top end of, of the range that you can really legitimately afford, does it make sense to start looking for houses at, at around 550 so that when you have to pay the premium of 10 or five to 10%, it kind of lands you right at that comfort level that you've been, you've been struggling with. Let's find a property that makes sense for you five or 10% less so that you can use that five or 10% and come out on top. That's a strategy to win. Are you willing to take a look at what that looks like and what we have available in that range? I'll tell you what, guys, that's a, that's a winner of a, of a strategy. Because now, instead of them literally counting out their last 17 quarters to try and be the winner, they can confidently go in at six, uh, 600 or 610 for a 549 house and easily win hands down. And they can feel good about it. They don't have to feel stressed and stressed out, right? What else? I hope this is kind of what you were looking for, because if not, we've spent 52 minutes on down a bunny trail that, <laughs> that doesn't matter. So, so tell me what else. What, what else are you running into that we could uh, brainstorm and or um, objection handle? While you're thinking, let me give you one more. Um, just just to make sure we put a period on the end of that sentence of, I don't want to get into a bidding war and now I'm upset that I lost the house because I, I chose not to be in a bidding war. Remember, again, when, when you are focused on objectively helping them move forward, not every one of you is going to have a winning hand every single time, right? Sometimes you might be on the, on the tail end of not winning the house. Do your best to keep the buyer focused objectively on next steps. And the first thing that I would do, well, so the very first thing I would do, if Jessica's the listing agent and she comes back to me and says, you know, Rick, sorry, we, the, the, the sellers have gone with a, another offer. We'd love to keep your offer as a backup uh, if that's what your buyers are looking for. Thank you so much for bringing it. Uh, we appreciate it. The very first thing I'm going to do as a buyer's agent is ask Jessica, so Jessica, I'm curious, thank you for that information. I'm curious, is there anything that my buyers can do right now? Anything at all that they can do right now to adapt their offer 
to change the seller's mind and be the winning bid. I have asked that on behalf of clients. I've asked it on behalf of myself when I'm buying my own investment properties. And I will tell you that sometimes the listing agent says, well, so here's the deal. If, if, they, can, if they can raise their offer by $10,000 and remove the inspection contingency, because that's kind of what we have on the other side, that they, they kind of liked your folks, you were first to the table, and I think that might work. Now, the listing agent would have to have the approval of the seller to say that, but if Jessica did and told me that, you know what, hold on, I'll, let me call you right back. Boom, and now I'm back to the buyers to say, look, they went in a different direction. I was just told that if you raise your offer $10,000 and remove this uh, contingency, the house is yours. I'm curious, under those circumstances, are you still willing to move forward? Or would you like to stay as a backup? Right, I'm the options guy, I'm gonna give you your options. You have the option now of adjusting and winning or accepting the reality that they went in a different direction and staying as a backup and we go look at something else. I've won bids that way that I lost the first time around by simply asking that question. Sometimes we get it in our heads that when the listing agent comes back and says they went in a different direction, that all bets are off and everything's closed. And I have found that sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not. So be willing to immediately ask that question to make sure that you don't have a second bite at the apple. A question I get asked a lot is, well, but, but they came back to us after they said highest and best. Okay, I would still ask the question. Because until they put pen to paper and everybody signs a contract, right, something that, that, that with some teeth in it, I'm gonna continue to advocate for my buyers and make sure that there's nothing that can be done to aggressively come out on top. What's interesting is that that's not where I was going when I said one more thing, and now I don't remember what the other thing was. <laughs> oh, Christmas Eve. Hmm. What was it? What was it? While you're thinking, can I just say one thing? Yeah, of course. <laughs> If any of you want to have your clients look at a variety of price points and down payment options, we will do a pre-qual letter for any of those prices. I mean, you can have five pre-qual letters or just have the client or you know, the buyer thinking in terms that they might have to go higher and how high will they, are they willing to go on any property? And that way they're a little more confident when they make their offer. Love that, love that. So where I was going was, uh, was this, remain objective. Even if you're on the losing side, the first thing to do is be aggressive and see if you can't make, change the scenario, right? And when, if it comes to the point where there isn't anything else that you can do to change the scenario, you get to go back to the buyers to say, so, okay, so, so Maria and Tom, um, the sellers chose a different offer. And so right now, unless you tell me differently, your, your offer is going to be held in a backup position just in case something goes sideways with the folks that they chose. Well, why didn't they choose us? Was the hot other offer higher? What could we have done differently? You know, great question. And unfortunately, in, in scenarios like this, we rarely know exactly what the, what the price and terms were of the property that they, of the buyers they did, they did go with. However, let me ask this. Is there anything that you can see that you could take away from this experience, knowing that, that we didn't quite come out on top, that would help you in your next offer, that would help you craft something different for the next house. Guys, and it's really important that, that we do this for two reasons. The first reason is that oftentimes buyers do a, a spiral, a, an emotional downward spiral when they lose a house, right? It's like literally the worst thing on the planet that has ever happened to them. And that's not really true. And yet sometimes it feels that way because they were all excited. They were all, they, they were all in on this. They thought they really made a great offer. And maybe they did. And sometimes it just doesn't roll their way. So in order to help them out of or not get into the emotional downward spiral, I want to immediately focus them on what's coming next. I want to immediately focus them on the next offer. 
And so by having a conversation around, you know, what can we take away from this one that might change the next one, you're, you're, you're future pacing them. You're pointing them forward to say, this was not the only property for you. There's going to be another one. As a matter of fact, what about that one we saw right after this one that you said was also kind of awesome, but not as awesome as this one? Does it make sense for us to go and make an offer on that one right now, utilizing the tools that we just used, plus anything you've learned from this experience? And the reason you ask that question, whether they answer it verbally or not, you want them in their head to start thinking through the process of, yeah, you know what, I, I, I had an extra $5,000 that I was willing to spend on this and I didn't do it and now it's too late. So on the next one, I'm not keeping that in my pocket anymore, right? Okay, so escalation clauses. Um, so if there's any other uh, comments or questions you wanna um, cover today, pop them in the chat or be ready to unmute. Let's just talk quickly about escalation clauses because um, the question in the chat box is, what are your thoughts on escalation clauses as a way to help the buyer win a bidding war? Uh, my personal opinion is that I think they work really well most of the time. They do not work really well all of the time. And for those of you who don't know what an escalation clause is, an escalation clause is me writing up an offer for Jennifer that says, Jennifer offers on this 595 house, Jennifer offers $35,000 over the highest verifiable offer up to $650,000, which means Jennifer's offer at 35 over the highest verifiable offer would beat anybody up to $649,000 because she has a, a max of 650 on it. See how that works? So a couple of things. First, you may hear from listing agents that that's not legal in the state of Connecticut, that it, that it absolutely is both in New York and in Connecticut, it is legal to use escalation clauses, right? People who tell you it's not legal don't know what they're talking about. That, that is a legal form of, uh, of, of writing an offer in both states. Number two, what I find is that when you get the that's not legal, what it really means is I've never done that before. I, I'm not exactly sure how to talk to my seller about that. I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with that, so therefore I'm going to qualify it as not possible. Um, if you have a listing agent who, who has that position, it is sometimes hard to have your escalation clause uh, presented because the listing agent goes to the seller and says, they're doing this weird thing with numbers and, and whatnot and convinces the seller not to, not to address it. And so sometimes the listing agent will come back and say, look, the seller is not interested into this whole escalation clause thing. They just want a number. Does the seller have a right to come back to you and say that? Yeah, sure they do. Sure they do. The seller can, can entertain or not entertain whatever they want. And so now you have to have another objective conversation with the buyers that says, okay, so that strategy on, in this scenario isn't going to work because the seller is not going to entertain the offer that way. So if you're willing to go to 650, should we just write the offer for 650? Or do you want to do something more or less, right? And give them a number. However, that's not most of the time that I'm just giving you kind of the outliers. Oftentimes, those kinds of, uh, of escalation clauses are aggressive ways to, to bring your buyer to the top. Because most, most everybody else is going in with a number, you're going in with, I'll beat that number by X amount of dollars up to a certain point. Make sense? And remember the, 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 the terminology is <clears throat> highest verifiable offer, right? The listing agent needs to bring you the other offer and they can redact the, the name if they want, but they need to bring you the other offer that says this person was willing to spend $640,000, which now makes your client's offer a 650. Make sense? So is that happening a lot these days, Rick? Especially in this kind of market? I think it's happening way more than it ever has, right? You, you guys used to be the only ones who brought, who brought escalation clauses to the table, right? Because we were teaching it in our offices 
and and it was it was kind of I mean where's 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 Jessica right Jessica would you would you agree with that right that for a while when, when we were bringing them out there they, you were kind of alone when you brought that to the table of course I was I was in your class when you talked about it when I, I walked out and got into a multiple offer situation and it worked out but that was her first this was four years ago and she said that's not legal said, yes it is and then it was probably like a year later agents would say oh you Keller Williams people in your escalation clause and it's a thing <laughs> yeah and, and what was so cool about it is that because we were teaching it and you guys were using it you guys were winning right and so the clients were winning and you were winning which was all awesome now as the as the uh, market in the last six months has just gone bonkers, I think we've seen more and more people. Right, people people were losing and losing and losing, and so somebody woke up and said, "Yeah, remember that Keller Williams thing? What was that called? Maybe we should start using that." Right, mm -hmm. and so and so again, we didn't invent it. We just we just were the ones who were bringing it to the table to help you win in multiple offer scenarios. Uh, so is it more uh, prevalent nowadays? In the last six months, certainly yes, um, it, and yet it's still not like every, it's, you don't see it every day and you certainly don't see it every, um, every, uh, every offer. Anything else uh, as, we, as we tick out of time that we missed that, that you wanna make sure that we answer for you uh, before we finish today? Uh, Rick, uh, for this escalation uh, clause that do we use um, the regular binder with some attachment or is there is something separate do we have? Yeah, so great question. And so, uh, so I think many of you have just been writing it on kind of a, 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 an addendum to the offer to purchase. Um, we do have an escalation clause form that we have been pushing DocuSign to format to get it into DocuSign for you, but it, we're still, they're, they are so far behind in, uh, in processing new forms that it's not in there yet. So uh, I do have a document that if you need it, just let me know and I can email it to you. You can kind of fill it in yourself. Uh, and we're working to get that into DocuSign so you can then just do plug and play with the, uh, with the escalation clause. But in the absence of anything, you can simply just write what I, what I said verbally on the uh, purchase agreement or offer to purchase and work with it that way. Anything else? Any other objections you wanna make sure that we handle? So what I hope you brought away from today was, right, because we spent a lot of time on, on scripts and we spent a lot of time on strategies and we spent less time, frankly, on actual buyer objection handlers. And yet what I find is that every time we have a conversation about buyer objection handlers, the real conversation is, is what we had. Because if you'll use those strategies and set those expectations, so many of the issues that you're looking for words to solve don't pop up. Or they pop up in a way that you can reference your consultation or reference your expectation setting conversation and remind people about realities or something that you've already discussed, right? So, so in that, I hope that this was helpful to you. When a, when a buyer, if you're, if you're looking to handle things with a buyer as they're happening and you haven't set the stage properly, you have a far more difficult time. So I want to, I want to continue to push you back. And remember, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out one last time because I thought it was really powerful. Have, call your buyers back in for a second consult. Do what Chris Kling is talking about. If you, if you missed that yesterday, give Chris a call. He'd be happy to talk, to talk you through what he's doing and how he's doing it, right? Have, have that second consult to really reorder everything so that if you do get to a spot of, of being in a tough position, you have something to rely back on. All right, guys, if there's nothing else, there's no other questions, comments, or concerns, we can be done for the day. Thanks so much as always. For those of you in Ignite, I'll see you at four o'clock today in just a few scant hours. I'm going to eat my chicken, so I'm energy <coughs> for later. A Gesundheit, whoever just sneezed, we will see you later. Great, great session. <coughs>